Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for the Physical Chemistry 2 course. Over the past few videos, we've looked at phenomena that couldn't be explained using the ideas of classical physics, including blackbody radiation, the photoelectric effect, and the emission spectrum of hydrogen. We found out that those phenomena can be explained when we realize two things. First, particles like electrons can only have certain specific energies. For example, as we saw in the last video, the electron in a hydrogen atom must have an energy described by this equation. This equation tells us something very important about the way matter works. The variable n must be a positive integer. If n is equal to 1, then the electron has an energy of negative 2.180 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And if n is equal to 2, the energy is negative 5.451 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So, the energy of the electron can be either of those two values, but it can't have a value in between those two. That's not what classical physics predicts. According to the ideas of classical physics, the energy of an electron could have any value at all. This idea that the energy of a particle is quantized is one of the fundamental ideas of quantum mechanics. The second basic idea that makes quantum mechanics so powerful is the idea that all objects that we usually think of as particles actually have characteristics that make them like waves. That's one of the main ideas we discussed in the previous video, and we'll spend this video and the next few delving into that idea and finding out what it tells us about how matter behaves. But before we can get too deep into the wave nature of matter, we need to remind ourselves of some basic ideas of mathematics that you may not have talked about very much in your previous coursework. Quantum mechanics has the reputation of being very challenging mathematically, so we want to make our job of understanding it as easy as we possibly can by equipping ourselves with some easy mathematical tools that you may never have used before. To start out with, we'll use some mathematical ideas that were first proposed by the Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler in the 18th century. Euler might have been the most productive mathematician of all time, even including the ancient Greeks. The collection of all his published works is 92 volumes long, and many of the most basic mathematical ideas we use in geometry, calculus, and number theory were influenced by Euler. Even the way we write math equations has a lot to do with Euler. He came up with the symbols i for imaginary numbers, pi for the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, f parentheses x for a function with the variable x, capital sigma for summations, and the number e that we use as the basis of natural logarithms is even named Euler's constant. And he did all this work despite the fact that he became almost blind in his left eye after an illness when he was about 30 years old, and lost the sight in his right eye after a botched cataract surgery when he was in his 50s. Anyway, one of the areas that Euler worked on is called complex numbers. You might be familiar with the number called i, which is equal to the square root of negative 1. A real number multiplied by i is called an imaginary number. But this is kind of deceptive. Imaginary numbers aren't really imaginary at all. They're quite real, and as we'll see later in this course, they're very important in describing the waves that characterize particles like electrons. Anyway, if we add or subtract a real number and an imaginary number, we get what's called a complex number. We can write a complex number using this general formula. Here, the first term is the real part, and the second term is the imaginary part. x and y are two real numbers. You've probably run across complex numbers a few times in your previous coursework without realizing it. For example, suppose we had the quadratic equation z squared plus z plus 1 equals 0. If we use the quadratic formula to solve for z, we find out that z equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 3 all over 2. 
We can write the square root of negative 3 as the square root of positive 3 times i. So both of the values of z include an imaginary number. In your previous courses, you probably ignored results that included negative square roots like this. But in this course, we'll see that they do matter, and we'll want to use them. It'll be helpful for us to understand how to do some basic math with complex numbers. So let's talk a little about how to add, subtract, multiply, and divide them. Adding and subtracting complex numbers is really easy. For example, suppose we have the complex number 3 minus 5i, and a second complex number, negative 2 plus 3i. To add them, we just add the two real parts, and separately add the two imaginary parts. Adding the two real parts gives us 1, and adding the two imaginary parts gives us negative 2i. Similarly, if we subtract the two numbers, we get 5 minus 8i. So far, it's pretty easy. However, if we multiply the two complex numbers, we have to be a little careful. When we multiply the two numbers, we treat them as though we were multiplying two binomials. So we'll use what you might know as the FOIL method. So we multiply the first term in each complex number, then multiply the two outermost terms, then the two innermost terms, and finally, the last term in each complex number. So, in our example, we multiply the first terms, which are 3 and negative 2, so that gives us negative 6. Next, we multiply the two outer terms, which are 3 and 3i, so that gives us 9i. Multiplying the two inner terms gives us positive 10i. And finally, multiplying the final terms gives us minus 5i times 3i, which is negative 15i squared. We can simplify this a little by adding 9i and 10i to get 19i. But notice there's one more thing we can do. i is equal to the square root of negative 1. So i squared is just negative 1. That makes this last term negative 15 times negative 1. So the last term is equal to positive 15. So for our final result, we get 9 plus 19i. Finally, let's look at how to divide two complex numbers. This is the trickiest one of all, but with a little practice, you'll be able to do these like a champ. For example, suppose we want to divide the first complex number by the second one. The fraction we get has an imaginary number on the bottom, and that's usually not the way we want things. Normally, we need the denominator to be a real number only, so we need to get rid of the imaginary number in the denominator. How do we do that? It turns out that we can get rid of the imaginary numbers in the denominator by using what's called a complex conjugate. The conjugate of a complex number is just the complex number, but with the sign on the imaginary term switched. So, for example, if our complex number were 5.2 minus 3 pi times i, the complex conjugate would be 5 plus 2 plus 3 pi times i. We usually indicate a complex conjugate by using an asterisk. So, for example, if we have a complex number with the symbol z, the complex conjugate has the symbol z star. Pretty simple. So, back to our example. To get rid of the imaginary number in the denominator, we need to multiply both halves of this fraction by the complex conjugate of the denominator. So, we multiply both the numerator and the denominator by negative 2 minus 3i. We perform both of these multiplications using the FOIL method that we just described a minute ago. That gives us negative 6 minus 9i plus 10i plus 15i squared in the numerator and in the denominator, 5.2 
4 plus 6i minus 6i minus 9i squared. If we simplify the numerator, we get negative 21 plus i. And in the denominator, we get 13. There are a couple of other things we'll want to know about complex numbers. For one thing, you're probably familiar with the real number line, which we usually draw as a horizontal line with the coordinates representing zero and all the positive and negative real numbers on it. However, the real number line does not feature imaginary numbers. In order to include imaginary numbers in a plot like this, we need a second axis. So we draw a vertical axis that crosses the real number line at the origin. Like the real number line, this one has coordinates for zero and positive and negative imaginary numbers. So if we have a real number like three, we can plot it on this graph here on the real number line. And if we have an imaginary number like negative five i, we can plot it on the imaginary number line over here. Now, if we have a complex number like three minus five i, we can plot it in this coordinate system by using the real part of the complex number as the x-coordinate and the imaginary part as the y-coordinate, which means that our point would be here. One thing we can do with this is express the location of the point using the coordinates three and negative five which are just the real numbers that appear in the two terms of the complex number. But sometimes we're going to want to use polar coordinates instead of Cartesian coordinates. You might remember that the two numbers we use in polar coordinates aren't x and y. Instead, they're r, which is the distance between the origin and the point on the plane, and theta, which is the angle required to reach that point starting at the x-axis and going counterclockwise. So how do we determine the polar coordinates? Well, we can calculate r using the Pythagorean theorem. r is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. In this example, that's the square root of 3 squared plus negative 5 squared. So that means that r equals the square root of 34, which is 5.831. To get the value of theta, we need to use a little trigonometry. You might remember that the tangent of theta is equal to y over x. So the tangent of theta is equal to negative 5 over 3. If we take the inverse tangent, we find out that theta equals 5.2. 253 radians. Notice that I determined theta in radians instead of degrees. That's usually the way we'll express angles in this course. One other thing about that calculation. If you've been following along with the discussion and tried the calculations yourself, your calculator might have given you a result of negative 1.303 radians instead of 5.253 for theta. If that happened, it means your calculator determined the angle by going clockwise from the x-axis instead of counterclockwise. To get the correct value, you'd need to add 2 pi to the value the calculator gave you. That would result in 5.253, the value that you want. So a good rule of thumb is that the value of theta should always be a positive number between 0 and 2 pi. If it isn't, you'll want to add or subtract multiples of 2 pi in order to get a value that is in the correct range. So, why would we be interested in using polar coordinates when we work with complex numbers? Well, suppose we have a generic complex number in Cartesian coordinates. So that would be x plus i times y. Let's convert that to polar coordinates. Using the basic definitions of sines and cosines, we know that x is equal to r times the cosine of theta, and y is equal to r times the sine of theta.
using those substitutions gives us this equation. We can simplify this a bit by factoring r out of the terms. But remember Leonard Euler, who we talked about earlier? One of the relationships he discovered was this one. e raised to the power i times theta is equal to the cosine of theta plus i times the sine of theta. If you compare that to the relationship we just derived, you can see that the term in parentheses is equal to e to the power i theta. So, in polar coordinates, a complex number can be written using the general format r times e to the power i theta. Okay, we've covered a lot of basic mathematics so far, so let's summarize it a bit. A complex number can be expressed using either Cartesian coordinates or polar coordinates. In Cartesian coordinates, the complex number has the format x plus i times y. In polar coordinates, it's r times e to the i theta. Also, think about what the complex conjugate would look like. Remember, to write the complex conjugate, we change the sign on the imaginary part of the complex number. So, in Cartesian coordinates, it's x minus i times y. And in polar coordinates, it's r times e to the negative i theta. The important thing here is that only the sign of the exponent changes when we're working in polar coordinates. So, why did we just spend so much time thinking about complex numbers? Well, remember that we said earlier that particles like electrons have some characteristics of waves. In order to get a deep understanding of the behavior of atoms and molecules, we need to understand what those waves are like. And it turns out that the waves are often described by equations that include imaginary numbers. The equation for a wave that's associated with matter is called a wave function. And we usually give it this symbol, which is the Greek letter psi. We'll spend the rest of this video and the next couple of videos talking about wave functions and their properties. To begin, let's talk a bit more about some of the basic ideas of quantum mechanics. We often say that quantum mechanics has five fundamental postulates that underlie all its important concepts. It'll take us a while to talk about all five of those postulates. Today, we're just going to worry about the first one. The first postulate of quantum mechanics is that any physical system, whether it's made of just a single particle or a whole group of many different atoms and molecules, is described by a wave equation called a wave function. And this wave function completely describes the system. In other words, the wave function is an equation that contains within it all the information that it is possible to know about the system. That sounds impossible, but in fact, it's true. If we know exactly what the wave function is, we can use it to learn anything we can possibly want to know about the system. So in other words, if we want to know the energy, the enthalpy, the momentum, the boiling point, vibrational modes, the magnetic dipole, or anything else at all about a molecule, we could do it mathematically without ever having to take a measurement or actually use the molecule if we know exactly what the wave equation we call the wave function for the system is. So how do we do that? Well, some of the other postulates of quantum mechanics will cover that, and we'll talk about those in the next few videos. But I do want to give you a bit of a preview by mentioning that, except for very, very simple systems, it's not possible for us to know exactly what the equation of the wave function is. So we have to be satisfied with a good approximation of it instead. But before we get to that, let's talk a little more about what a wave function is like. What kinds of features does a wave equation like this have? Well, one thing to know is that one of the properties that we can find out using a wave function is the location of our system. As we talked about in the previous video, because a system like an electron or an atom behaves like a wave, it doesn't have a well-defined edge because the wave stretches out throughout all space. 
That means we can't talk about the exact location of our system. Instead, we can only talk about the probability that a system is located in a particular place. So, for example, there might be a 95% chance that the system is in this region of space. We can use the wave function to determine those probabilities. Here's how. Suppose we want to know the probability that our system is located between the points x1 and x2 in the x dimension. That probability is given by this integral. Notice that the integral consists of the complex conjugate of the wave function multiplied by the original wave function. We usually say this is the integral of psi star psi. So, for example, suppose our wave function is equal to 1 plus i times x. We can put that into our equation. Psi star is equal to 1 minus i times x. And of course, psi is still just 1 plus i times x. When we multiply these together, we get 1 minus i squared times x squared dx, which simplifies to 1 plus x squared dx. Now we can determine the probability of finding the system between the points x1 and x2 by using those as the limits on our integral. However, as we'll see in just a second, this is a very unrealistic wave function. In fact, it would be a completely impossible wave function in reality. I just used it as an example because it's pretty easy to see how it would fit into our integral. So, what was wrong with that wave function? Well, first of all, it only has x as a variable. Of course, real systems are three-dimensional, so it would have x, y, and z as variables if we were using Cartesian coordinates. That means we'd have to adjust our equation a little, so it would look like this. Now we've got a triple integral, because we'd have to integrate over each of the three dimensions. So, this integral would tell us the probability that our system is located between x1 and x2 in the x dimension, y1 and y2 in the y dimension, and z1 and z2 in the z dimension. But there are even more reasons why the example wave function I used a few minutes ago would be impossible. For one thing, it turns out that every valid wave function must meet four conditions. First, think about what this equation is telling us. It describes the probability that we'd find a system in a particular region of space. But suppose we made the limits of the integrals positive and negative infinity. In that case, we'd be calculating the probability of finding the system anywhere in an infinitely large space. Well, we know that the system must exist somewhere, so the system has a 100% probability of being somewhere in that region. That means this integral must be equal to 1. So that's the first condition that our wave function must meet. Any valid wave function must give a probability of 1 if we evaluate the probability of finding the system between positive and negative infinity. When that's true, we say that the wave function is normalized. So every valid wave function must be normalized. That was not true for the example wave function that I used earlier. And that's one reason why it was an unrealistic example. The next condition that a wave function must meet is that both the wave function and its derivative must be single valued. In other words, if we were to plot the wave function, we couldn't get something like this. This wave function can have three different values at this point. That's not allowed. So, for example, take this wave function, where psi is equal to the square root of x. A plot of that function shows that it has two values for most of the plot. So, for example, where x equals 4, the wave function could be equal to both positive and negative 2. That makes this an invalid wave function. Don't forget, the derivative of the wave function must also meet this condition. 
Next, a valid wave function must be continuous. And here again, the derivative of the wave function must meet that condition too. By a continuous wave function, we mean that it can't have any features like this. That might seem like a pretty easy condition to meet. After all, most equations we're used to working with don't do that. However, consider this wave function where psi is equal to the absolute value of x. This looks fine at first. It's a single continuous line, even if it does change direction at zero. But remember, both the wave function and its derivative must be continuous. Think about what the plot of the derivative would look like. The derivative of this curve is equal to the slope. The slope is equal to negative 1 in this region until we get to this point. Here, the slope becomes equal to 0, just at that one point. And then after that, the slope is equal to positive 1. If we were to plot that derivative, it would look like this. And you can see that this is not a continuous function. So that makes this an invalid wave function. Finally, the last condition that a wave function must meet is that it and its derivative must be finite everywhere. The curve can never be positive or negative infinity, no matter how high or low the values of x, y, or z are. So, for example, the wave function psi equals e to the power negative x would not be valid. Here's what a plot of that would look like. You can see that the wave function approaches infinity as x goes to negative infinity. That makes this wave function invalid. So, to sum up, a valid realistic wave function must meet four conditions. It has to be normalized, and both the wave function and its derivative must be single-valued, continuous, and finite everywhere. Wow, we've covered a lot of new ground today. You'll get plenty of practice in class working with wave functions and learning to recognize which ones are valid and realistic and which ones aren't. When we meet again, we'll look at more of the basic postulates of quantum mechanics, and we'll start to see how we can use wave functions to determine the properties and behavior of a system. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week.